great schus, a great privilege to learn together. We had a little break, and in Mesa we're going to have another shear in two weeks. So this year we'll concentrate on Edel. What better time to speak about Edel? Matters of Tshuva. We're about three and a half weeks before Rosh Hashanah. I want to dedicate this year to a young man who had a surgery just about two and a half or three hours ago in the States. Mordechai Ephraim ben Sara Malka de Refua Shleima. In Mitzvah Hashem, Dibetera, they will say today that his Oyrus, that in Mitzvah Hashem, we will have today, should go up to his heavenly account. He should only know. Simcha and Nacha, Satzlach and Bacha, and Brius Me'aliyadah, great, healthy life, together with his wife and children. And uh, his father is a dear friend. And in Mitzvah Hashem, the family should only know Simcha and Nacha. Man, we can't amen. start. We can't start before having our riddle of the day or riddle of the week. So let's start with that, and then we'll move into matters of uh, serious shuva, elu matters. Voisai, do we know that for honoring one's parents, kabed esavicha ve'esimecha? The Torah says, why? Leman, in order. Leman yarichun yamecha. Torah promises longevity for kibudav em. Our question today is, where do we find another four places? In total, we're looking for five places in the Torah. But the Torah promises longevity for a mitzvah. Five different mitzvahs, five different times that we see the Torah promises longevity for certain mitzvahs. A boy side, what do you say? You can unmute your mics and share your thoughts. So we have two out of five. Kibudavaim and Shiluach Haken. Well, we're looking for three more. What do you say, my friends? Three more mitzvahs in the Toya. Say the Shema, eh? I'm sorry? Say the Shema? Say the Shema. Where does it say that if you do that, you'll have an extension to life? Okay. Re refraining from lotion horror. Is that in the Torah? The Torah Shon Kamera. Tehidim la medalet, but does it say that in the Torah explicitly? No. So the one who said Shema is pretty close because in Kiev Shema, Ba'alatuvim in Parshas Ekev, in Perek Yudalef, Pasuk Chaf Aleph says that for the mitzvah of mezuzah, which is mentioned there, we say it every day. Right after the mezuzah, we say, Leman yilbu yemeichem v'imei v'nechem, yilbu yemeichem, right after mezuzah, because mezuzah extends one's life. That is what Ba'alatuvim says. So we have three, Kibud Avayim, mezuzah, Shiluach HaKen, in Parshas Kiseitze, our Parsha for this Shabbos, but we still have Two more to go. One from last week's Pasha, Pasha Shokim, and another one hiding in the coming Pasha, Pasha Skiseitze. In Pasha Shokim, there's a special mitzvah for a king to read and observe the Torah. And the Torah promises, Leman Ya'arich Yamim, Hu Mamlachto. He will have a long life. He will be able to reign for a long time. That is Pasha Shokim. This coming Shabbos, there's another promise for longevity, for having accurate scales in one's possessions. The Torah says, if you do this, your life will be longer. Longevity, we should all merit to have a healthy Mitzvah life with tremendous uh, motivation to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu and to do his will. So Rabbi Isaac, we're jumping now into the matter that we really are supposed to discuss today, Elul and Tshuva. But I want to start with a fantastic Maise, really amazing, true Maise. There's a lifeguard on one of the beaches in Tel Aviv, this goes back about 80 years ago, who told this over, who told this story. He said one day, he was on the beach, and there was no one there, just one guy. And the lifeguard noticed, that this guy's about to drown. So he's getting closer, he wants to save his life, and suddenly he hears this guy starting to yell, No! I'm not gonna do chuba! No, no, no! I'm not gonna do chuba! No! I'm not doing chuba! 
very strange. I'm about, I'm about to die. And that's the only thing I can think of. No, I'm not going to do tshuva. I'm not going to do tshuva. And the lifeguard gets closer and closer. And Bo Hashem, he was able to pull him out of the water. He takes him out. A guy passes out. The lifeguard attends to him. And after a few minutes, Bo Hashem, he's back and running. He gives him something to drink. And then the lifeguard asks him, you know, I have to ask you. When I was getting closer, I said to you before, I heard you yelling, No, no, I'm not going to do tshuva. Who are you talking to? There was no one there. And the guy kept kind of embarrassed. Says, oh, oh, you heard me? Well, you must know. I'll tell you. I grew up in Europe. And I was a slotim al chasid. And I went off the derech as it is called, way off. And my father was very upset, but we had a good relationship. And then at one point I decided, I'm going to make Aliyah. And my father asked me to go with him to get a bracha from the Rebbe, from the Slot and the Rebbe. And I said, what do I have to do with the rabbis? What is that going to help me? And my father really insisted, and I figured, what do I have to lose? You know, One last time. Give a little nachas to my father. So I went with him. And the Rebbe talked to me a few minutes, and then he looked at me in the eyes and he said, you should know. It's not going to help you. You're not going to leave this world before you do tshuva. And I always remember that. And I made aliyah, and I moved to Eretz Yisrael, and I moved to a kibbutz of HaShomer HaTzair. Can you have a more anti-religious entity than that? And I went off the derech even further. And I did all the aveos in the Torah. I really, really ran far. But I always remembered what the Rebbe said. Today, when I started to drown, I suddenly remembered, wait, wait a second, wait a second. The Rebbe said, I won't leave this world before I do tshuva. That means for me, not to do tshuva is a sgula for longevity. So I said, no, I'm not doing tshuva. You can't kill me. The Rebbe promised. I won't leave this world before I do tshuva. I believe the Rebbe. So therefore I said, I'm not doing tshuva. For me, not to do tshuva, it's a sgula for a long life. So this is kind of funny, but we have a better sgula. And that is to do tshuva. To get closer to the Reboi Shaloyla, can't have a better sgula for, for, of the, from the Atlas. For everything. For a long life. For a healthy happy, prosperous life. So we all want to change. And we want to collect mitzvahs. You know, we have Tariyad mitzvahs. We have 630 mitzvahs. Let me ask you. What mitzvah is the easiest mitzvah to perform? We know the hardest is Ki Budavahem. Nothing like it. But what's the easiest mitzvah out there? What do you say? Easiest mitzvah from the Tariyat mitzvah that we have in the Torah. You can unmute your microphones and, and participate. What would be the easiest mitzvah of the 613 different mitzvahs that we have in the Torah? To love Hashem. I'm sorry? To love Hashem. To love Hashem. Is that so easy? Yeah. There are different levels of, of love of Hashem. Can one say, I really fulfill this mitzvah as it's supposed to be fulfilled? Where it is. Where it sits is. How much does the tzitzis cost? A few kopecks. And what if the store is closed and it's Friday afternoon, and they're going to open Monday morning in Chutz Lais. I'm not going to have an opportunity to have a mitzvah for three days. Is it so easy at all times to perform this mitzvah? What if I don't have these two copies? I don't have two shekels to my name. What do I do then? Yeah. Oh, God. You're stuck somewhere in your tzitzit store, and you don't have any way of getting a new one. Is it such an easy mitzvah to perform? What if it's very, very hot? You're boiling, and they tell you you have to wear a tzitzit now. Is it so easy? Yeah. Uh, Shilu, based on today's shir. Usually that's the first answer people say. Shilu, okay, because what do you have to do? Whoop, you got to do this. <laughs> Only come across and the when nest. when you do this, you just fulfill the mitzvah. 
But wait a second, is it so easy to perform this mitzvah? When was the last time you had a nest near your house that it's so easy for you do it to do? If you come across the nest. I'm sorry? You only have to do it if you come across the nest. Right, mm. but I want a mitzvah which is near, that I can always do, that is so not easy. Sure. And by the way, Shiluach again is not so easy. Because what if a person has like problems, problems with his arm? What if a person is an, uh, he is sick? He's in the hospital and his hands are tied down. He can't use his hand to do this. So it's but not easiest, necessarily so easy. Before. Arab Gold, I see you just joined us now. We dedicated this year to the Rufu Shlema of your son when we started. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would say based doing tshuva. Aha! Arab Gold, two points. The easiest mitzvah in the world to perform is doing tshuva. What's the proof to that? The proof is from Magemora and Kiddushin Daf Memtes Amud Beis. The Gemara says, one who's Mekadesh, a wife, he goes to a lady and says, Listen, would you like to be my wife? Almenas, he makes a condition. Almenas Shanit Sadik. Check me out, you'll see I'm a Sadik. Says the Gemara, a filu who Russia Gamu, even if he's a complete wicked individual, Hare he Mekudeshes. She's Mekudeshes. There is a version of the Gemara that he says, Almenas and Itzadigamu, and yet Mekudeshes. The reason is, Shema Hirher Tshuva Belibo. Maybe he had thoughts of Tshuva. You see from here, it's very, very easy. All you need to do is to have a little thought of Tshuva. He thought about Tshuva in his heart. He fulfilled the mitzvah of Tshuva. The Rishonim say, she's only Suffolk Mekudeshes. Only Suffolk. But the Meiri writes that she is Mekudeshes because that is what the Lashon of the Gemara points to. The base Shmuel said that even to those Rishonim who say that she's Suffolk Mekudeshes, that's only as long as we didn't hear from him that he says, yes, yes, I really did think about Tshuva. But if he comes and he says, I did have a thought of Tshuva, everyone would agree. The Kulay Alma, she yes, is Mekudeshes. You see from here the easiest method to perform. Even when one is sick, is tshuva. So this works out very well for us because that's exactly the type of mitzvah that we need now. Since you did so good on the previous questions, and since we have a, a good record going here in the past few with our beautiful base dean, let me ask you a lucky question. Years ago, in the city of Tiveria, there was a Frum Hotel. Hotel Dvora was his name. Hotel Dvora was getting ready for Rosh Hashanah, and one of the okay. things that they did is hired a Baal Tokea, who's going to blow Shreifa for all the guests. The guy comes on Rosh Hashanah, he's supposed to get $1,000 for these two days, and he takes out the Shreifa the first day, and he puts it in his mouth, and he tries and tries really hard. Nothing comes out. Not even one little sound. He tries again. He tries again, and he tries again. And he tries again, and nothing comes out. So embarrassing. The owner of the hotel gets up and he says, My friends, is there anyone here that knows how to blow shoifa? And a guy picks up his hand and says, I can do it. And he takes the shoifa, and in fact, he blows beautiful. Really, really nice. Ad kan hakafa alif. Now comes the kafa base. Motse yontif. After two days, the Baal Tukia, the hired Baal Tukia, who wasn't able to produce any sound, comes to the owner of the hotel and he says, okay, my friend, so I hope you had a great yontif. Uh, remember, you owe me a thousand dollars. And the owner says, what? What did you say? We had an agreement. I come here to blow Shreifa and you owe me a thousand dollars. That's what you have to pay. And the owner of the hotel says, what are you talking about? But you didn't blow Shreifa. But this guy says, wait a second. Do you think you pay me for blowing Shreifa on Yontif? I don't work on Yontif. The Mishnah Bura says that one who works on Yontif, Eino Roye Siman Bracha. You're not going to see any blessing from that money. I don't work on Yontif. You know what you pay me for? You pay me for the Hachana, for the preparation. And believe me, I prepared. Ooh, believe me, I prepared. You know, for a month and a half, from the time that we had the agreement, every single day, two hours, you can ask my neighbors. I was driving them nuts. 
every single day, two hours. I was writing the shayfa. I prepared. And you're supposed to pay me for the preparation. Not for the blowing on Yontif. I don't work on Yontif. And therefore, it's your bad luck that caused this, that nothing happened on Yontif. No sound came out of me. But that's not what you paid me for. You paid me for the preparation, and I, in fact, prepared. Uh, you need to pay me a thousand dollars. And the owner of the hotel says, it's ridiculous. I hired a Baal Tokea. You're not a Baal Tokea. Complicated Shaira. It must go into the Ra'anana community and others joining us from different places in the world. My friends, what do you say? Does he have to pay or not? You can unmute your microphones and participate. Should have to pay. He should or he should not? He should. He should pay. Why is that? He was an honest. He is. It's supposed to be honest. You said. He was an honest. Couldn't help it. He was the honest. What can he do? Anyone disagrees and thinks that the owner of the hotel doesn't have to pay. He doesn't have to pay. Why not? Because he, the job he hired him for, he didn't do. Normally, when you hire somebody to work for you on Tuesday and the person doesn't perform the job that he's supposed to do on Tuesday, you don't pay him. But here, the claim of the Baal Tokea is, I don't work on Yontif. But the money, the, money, should... the money that you promised me is for the preparation. There's such a thing called Sakhar Behavla. We don't work on Shabbos. We don't work on Yontif. So how is it that you do find Chazanim that go all over the world and they make a lot of money? How is that possible? We don't work on Shabbos or Yontif. What they do is they swallow, they have law, they swallow what they do on Shabbos with something that they do outside Shabbos or Yontif. And that's why many times you'll find a Chazan or Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur that he does the Slichas on Motzei Shabbos. Or he does mincha before the yontif starts, or he does the mayrit afterwards, and it's as if we are paying him for what he did on a weekday, and not for the yontif or Shabbos, or for the preparation. It takes a lot of preparation to get ready. So this guy says, "I did the necessary steps. I prepared. That's what I should be paid for." But you're saying that he didn't do the job. So do you want to pay him or not? No, no, I don't think so. This Shaila went <laughs> to Rabbi Yashiv Zecher Tzadik Lepoch. And Rabbi, Rabbi Yashiv said, Rabbi al is right. You get compensated for the preparation, not for work on Yontif. But you know what type of preparation? A preparation that yields results. And therefore, if you want to be paid for preparation, go find a hotel that pay you, that will pay you for the preparation without actually performing the service on Yom Tov Shabbos. You're right. You get paid for what you prepare ahead of time, as long as your preparation actually yielded the desired results. And therefore, he doesn't have to pay. But I think what we, we can take from here is that our preparation for Elul, we do some introspection. We take upon ourselves different resolutions, kabbalos. But these changes have to be the type that yield results. It's not just a preparation for Rosh Hashanah. It's supposed to carry us over to the next year that we will be on a higher madrega. And when next Rosh Hashanah comes, we shall supposed to be on a higher level. And the following year on a higher level. So it's a constant elevation. Preparation is great, but it needs to be the type of preparation that yields results. So let's ask another halachic shayla, a bal tshuva. Fascinating question. Listen to this. There's a bal tshuva who's in the business already 20 years since he became a bal tshuva. Now he comes to the rabbi and he asks, you know, rabbi, 20 years ago, before I was a bal tshuva, I ate in a restaurant in Tel Aviv. This restaurant is very, very, very not kosher. Most probably the only thing kosher there is the water. <laughs> the owner is a Yid. And they feed anyone who comes there. Many Jews, non-Jews. 
And I went in there and I was the, it was the best meal that I had. Very expensive meal. But you know what I did? When it was about time to pay, I asked for the check. The waiter came and gave me the check. It was 500 shekels. And I looked at the bill and then I said to the waiter, just, just one second please, I have to go to an important place. And I went to an important place, but from there I went into my car. And I disappeared. I never paid them. So Rabbi, my question to you now, 20 years later, do I have to pay the 500 shekels to the owner of the restaurant? And the rabbi hears the question and says, and why not? You ate and you didn't pay? Of course you have to pay. But remember, this guy's already 20 years in the business. He became a London. He's a Talmud Chogim. And he says, Rabbi, I don't think it's so partial. It's not so simple. Why not? Asks the rabbi. And the guy says, look, in Psochim Chav Gimel, and this is ruled in Shulchan Och, in Yoledea, Simin Kuf Yud Zayin, it's very easy to remember what Seif, because there's only one Seif in Kuf Yud Zayin, Seif Aleph. Shulchan Och Paskins, that something which is forbidden from the Torah, <coughs> one is not allowed to do business with, one is not allowed to benefit, it's Asu Behana'a. Even though it's Muta, technically Behana, you're not allowed to do business with it, you're not allowed to sell it, if it's something which is for food, something you're, you're not allowed to eat. Chazir. You're not allowed to sell it. And if that's the case, if the owner of the restaurant wasn't allowed to sell it, what exactly did I take from him? If it's valueless because you're not allowed to sell it, so all I took from him is air. If I took air, if you want, I'll give him back some air, but why do I have to give him 500 shekels? And the rabbi hears this, and he asks that we should run to the Zoom shearer with the Ranana community and others and ask, does he have to pay or not? <laughs> My friends, do you want him to pay 500 shekels for what he ate 20 years ago? Or maybe not. <clears throat> what do you say, my friends? Yeah, I yeah, think he should pay. pay. Why is that? Because he, he, he took, took something, something that costs cost, what it costs. Cost. And he, he was the person that gave it to him. Let me ask you a question. If somebody steals a uh, broken, burnt, half a toothpick, does he have to pay? Well, that's, oh, that's something else. That's, that's not, not worth, worth anything. anything. But he, he, he ate all that, that food. And... What does it mean it's not worth anything? It's worth less than a pluta, right? It's worth less than a six, seven agorot in today's currency. Less than a pluta. So if you steal something less than a pluta, you don't have to pay. If the guy was not allowed to sell the chazir, so it has the same value as our half-broken burnt toothpick. It's worth less than a puta. You're not allowed to earn anything from it. If that's the case, he didn't take anything. He took air. So why does he have to pay But he took the person's time. Right. What about, what about the, the waiter? There's people, there's the whole staff. Yeah. They, they... Okay, so let's estimate that that's um, 42 and a half shekels. He wants 500 shekels. He's sitting in a fancy place. place. He's sitting in a very fancy place. The ambiance, the music. And the smell and the decorations, 42 and a half shekels. Take it off. Fine. Let's talk about five, 468 <laughs> shekels, or 38 shekels, whatever is left. I'm talking Marco. about the value of the food. Does he have to pay or not? Yeah, he has to pay. You know, the, the Rashva in the Taz brought in Yehuda Kup Yuzayn. They say the reason that you're not allowed to sell something which you're not allowed to eat is because we're afraid you're going to come to eat it. So you're not allowed to sell. You're not allowed to benefit from it so much that the police can stretch it to say that one is not allowed to be a waiter in a non-kosher restaurant. Where are you getting your paycheck from? From the chazir. You're not allowed to benefit from it. You're not allowed to earn money from it. So if it's worth zero and the, the owner of the, the uh, restaurant wasn't allowed to sell it, so the guy didn't steal anything from him. But well, they did sell it. They did, did something wrong. 
They did something wrong. What if a person steals chametz before Pesach? And uh, this chametz wasn't sold, and we can't use chametz that wasn't sold. After Pesach, the guy has Hilhure Tshuva, and he comes back to the owner of the chametz, and he says, here, here it is, here's your chametz. He gives it back to him. How much is it worth now? Zero, a big fat zero, because the owner of the chametz can't use it. It's chametz she'ava alava Pesach. It's chametz that wasn't sold before Pesach. You can't use it. It's valueless. So if it's valueless, why should he pay? You know, I'm surprised. You're supposed to ask me something. If it's true what I'm saying, that you're not allowed to sell those things that you're not allowed to eat, how is it that we always sell to the goyim Treyft chickens in the shechtois, in the slaughtering house. When we shecht and we find a treyft chicken, we sell it to the goyim. So what are you telling me that you're not allowed to sell it to the goyim? The answer is in that same seif in Shulchan Aruch, Yorid Yaakov Yuzayin, the Shulchan Aruch says, if it's what's called nizdamen lo, if you happen to have a non-kosher item, you can sell it. But if that is your business, you're not allowed to. So by the Shechtois, our business is kosher food. Every so often we have something trade. We sell it to the Goyim. But this restaurant owner is in the non-kosher business. He's not allowed to sell. This Shaila too went to Rabbi Yoshev Zecher Tzadik Lebrocha and he said a brilliant and beautiful observation. He said Rabbi Yoshev. You're telling me that he sold something that didn't have any value? Not true? Not true. That morning, when this happened 20 years ago, the owner of the restaurant could have gotten up in the morning and say, wait a second, what am I doing? I'm selling non-kosher. This is crazy. HaKadosh Baruch I love you. I'm doing tshuva. I'm moving into the kosher restaurant business. The non-kosher restaurant that he has, all the food now, are viewed as nizdamenlo, as temporary. This is not his main business. And if that's the case, he's allowed to sell them. So what are you telling me he's not allowed to benefit? He's not allowed to sell? That's not true. He could have done shuba in the morning. And he could have sold everything in the restaurant. I, but you'll say, but ultimately he didn't do shuba. You're right. But he could have. And the power of shuba is such that it can turn a zero into 500 shekels instantly. So he has to pay. Uh, boy, say if the power of Shuba is so great, it can turn a chazil from zero to 500. And if this was in a different country to $500, what can Shuba do to our soul? Our neshama doesn't start at zero. Oh no, chaz v'sholom starts with billions. How does it ascend by the power of tshuva? Baal tshuva is the greatest, most honorable title in the world. Not a doctor, not a lawyer. A Baal tshuva! Why are people embarrassed with this beautiful, beautiful title? Baal means you're the owner. You own it! Why can be better? We should strive that this will be our title. Rabbi Akiva had this title. Reshlakish. In Bab Metziah Peyeh Mudalek, we learn that the grandson of Reb Shimon Bar Yochai, the son of Reb Lazar, had this title about Shuba. The grandson of Reb Talfon. What about Oculus? And so many more. It's the greatest title. Baalaturim in Parshas Nitzavim says, the Pasuk says, Ki Tashuv El Hashem Elokecha. Should return to Akkadish Baruch your God. And right next to it, the pastor says, Ki ha mitzvah hazois. Loimar, says the Balaturim, this comes to teach you. Sheshkula hi ha tshuva keneged kol ha mitzvah skulam. A tshuva has the weight corresponding to all the mitzvahs. So now that we're all convinced, tshuva, tshuva, tshuva. A guy comes and says, listen, okay, fine, I'm changing. What should we recommend to a person who becomes a Baal tshuva? What should be the first Thing that he rectifies. He is 56 years old. He now realizes that the Kodesh Baruch in the world, the Torah is Emes, 
and he has to adhere to everything the Torah says. Everything. Fine. Great. So, what do you want me to do first? What should we recommend to Baal Shuvah to do the first thing as soon as he starts his Shuvah process? What do you say? Kashus. Kashus. Why Kashus? That is true. Chazal say that when you eat the wrong foods, it destroys your genetic makeup. You mm -hmm. won't be able to learn it. You won't be able to maintain, retain the Torah that you learned. But uh, is that more important than Shabbos? Yeah. Anyone has a different idea, maybe, for what the first thing about Shuvah should be? Taival in the mikveh. <laughs> Are you a chassid? No. <laughs> Spoken like a true chassid. <laughs> Well, maybe we should say it depends if he's a Sephardi or Ashkenazi. Why is that? The Shulchan Aruch and Orchaim Simen Zayin Seif Gimel says that one who goes to the bathroom, he forgot to say Asher Yatsa. Then he goes again to, to the bathroom. So what should he do? According to the Shulchan Aruch, he should stay, he should say twice Asher Yatsa when he comes out the second time. So for our friend who's what do we say, 55 years old, 56 years old? <laughs> Just do the math. He didn't say Asher Yatso from the time of his Bar Mitzvah, 13, when he was 13 years old. Which means now 50, 43 years later, he has a lot of Asher Yatso's to do back to back, according to the Shulchan Aruch, if he's a Sephardi. But what if he's an Ashkenazi? Well, the Rema. Rules regarding the mitzvah of Shnai Mika Vecha Targum every week. We must read the Pasha twice and once the Unkalut. But I must say that if you forgot a few weeks, you weren't able to do it, you can do Hashlama. You can fix it until Simcha Stoya. So if this guy did Shuva one week after Simcha Stoya, he has a lot of work. He has to, I'm sorry, if he did Shuva, a week after Simchas Torah, he's in good shape. He only has to do the races. But if he did Shuvah a week before Simchas Torah, or two weeks before, he has to cover the entire Torah with Shnai Nika Vecha Tagum. That's a lot of work. This is not something we will recommend to about Shuvah. This is just to, to get you in the right mood. Because if we do say to about Shuvah, okay, so for the next 10 years of your life, just start saying, Asher Yatza. Or for the next Half a year of your life, just sit there and start saying, He will never do tshuva. This will lock the door for people to do tshuva. So this just, you know, You know, we are in the month of Elul. In the Saba of Kelim. The altar of Kelim hung a sign in his yeshiva. You know what Elul is all about? It's what the Gemara says in Brachos Daf Yud Zayin Amudale. Elul is an acronym for Ahuv Lemala Venechmad Lemata. It's a great Sgula. What is a Sgula to be beloved upstairs by a Kodesh Baoko? Ahuv Lemala? Question mark. You do that by becoming Nechmad Lemata. We should beautify the mitzvah of Smile to people because that will cause us. To be beloved by Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Elul is all about Ahuv lemala, by being Nechmad down here, Nechmad lemata. You did so well with the previous questions. I want to ask you another halachic question. There's a couple who live up north. The wife became a Baalist Shuba. Really tries to keep all the mitzvahs that she knows about. And her husband, the further she goes into Torah Mitzvah, the further he drifts away. Fine. She tries to keep kashus. She tries to keep Shabbos. And then one day she heard there's a great mitzvah called Mezuzah. It's a fantastic, fantastic mitzvah. And by the way, it allows the Kodesh Baruch to wash over the house. Mezuzah, Shin, Dalet, and Yud, Shoimer. Dalsos Yisrael, the Kodesh who watches over the home, then have a mezuzah. Up north, two years ago, there was all kinds of uh, souvenirs 
that our northern neighbors send us every so often, reminding us that they're there. Not, not that we forgot, but for some reason they thought that we have to be reminded. So they kept sending us some aerial souvenirs, and this was very frightening. So she figured this will be great. We'll put the mezuzah on our doorpost, and this will protect us. So she asked her husband, my dear husband, let's put some mezuzah. So you know it's a mitzvah from the Torah. And her husband says, that's just a money-making machine of the rabbis. Forget about it. She says, no, no, it helps protect the house. He says, no, it doesn't, he says to her. It's a piece of paper with some ink. It doesn't protect anything. It's nonsense. It's a waste of money. Do you believe I use things like this? Well, what can she do? So she started thinking of different ways how to get the mezuzah. And then she thought of something, and she called the rabbi. And she asked him the following question. Listen, Rabbi, it's not going to help with my husband. He is very stubborn. He's not paying a dollar to put this mezuzah on. But if I can tell him, you know, Chabad, Eshat Torah, different Kiev of organizations sent us mezuzahs, he will agree to put it on as long as it doesn't cost him anything. So what I want to do, Rabbi, is to take some money, to steal money from my husband in order to purchase some mezuz, and then I'll tell him that we got it for free from Chabad or from wherever, and then he'll agree. Am I allowed to steal money from my husband to fulfill the mitzvah di raisa, to our obligation to put the mezuzah on our doorpost? My friend, tough question, what do you say? No. <laughs> You're saying no. No. But, but you know, when in a base deen, no just doesn't go. Yes also doesn't go. You have to give some kind of a documentation. Some because kind I think of I want... Point. I'm sorry? Because she's, because she's going to now show the husband that from people steal. Terrible, to make a bad impression for the husband. Terrible for the husband. That's only in case he finds out, right? Chilul Hashem. Greatest yeah. Hashem. And what if we can ensure... <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Why is it a mitzvah b'avera? But the husband needs to live in a place with a mezuzah. She needs to live in a place with a mezuzah. You know, the husband signed a ksuba when they got married. One of the things that are in the ksuba is that the husband obligates himself to supply his wife with what's called a mador, a dwelling place. A Jewish dwelling place is one with a mezuzah, and without it, it's no better than a a dog's happy. A Jewish home must have a mezuzah, so he's not doing what he's supposed to. So she's helping him to fulfill what he signed on in the ksuba. So why do you want to say that he, she can't do it? Yeah. Anyone wants to allow her to do it? No takers? <laughs> you don't like it, huh? Loy signal. Loy signal. Is this stealing? Why is it stealing? It's, it's her husband. Her. It's her husband. Uh, she can do it. She can do it. She can do it. There we go. Let's see. We have a rule. Koma shekansa isha kanabaila. Anything that a woman acquires, it actually belongs to the husband. So it is considered stealing. But is she allowed to steal for this purpose? Let's see. What is the definition of the mezuzah? Mitzvah mezuzah is not a negative commandment. It's a positive one. The Torah doesn't say, thou shall not live in a place without a mezuzah. The Torah says, thou shall affix a mezuzah on his doorpost. The formulation of the mitzvah is that it's a positive commandment from the Torah. There is no Isur to live in a place without a mezuzah. The Mordechai clearly writes this in Maseches Menachos. In Simen Taftav Kuf Mem Dalet, the base Yosef brings this in all kinds, Simen Yud Gimel. And the Mordechai clearly says, do you think that you're not allowed to enter a house without a mezuzah? What you're doing is nullifying a mitzvah's essay. You're nullifying a positive mitzvah. But there's no Isur to live there. And you know what? Even if it was also to live in a place like this, it's not her problem. It's not her house. 
It's her husband's house. The woman is allowed to live there because she is anusa. She is forced not to fulfill this mitzvah. The husband is preventing her from doing so, and therefore she's not allowed to steal the money from her husband. So since the, the house belongs to the husband, and he himself lives there, so he is the one who's obligated the mezuzah, and, and not she. She's not obligated to do the mezuzah. And there's no isu to live there, and therefore she shouldn't do it. And in addition, what you said before, imagine, imagine if the husband ever finds out. What a chilul Hashem. And he's going to say to her, wow, that's a great religion you have there. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu obligates you to steal in order to fulfill his mitzvahs. I love this religion. Great Torah you have there. That would be a Terrible, terrible chilul Hashem. And therefore, the answer over there was that she's not allowed to steal the mezuzah. She should daven for him. And he meets Hashem soon. He will do a complete tshuva as well. Me'ahava. And together, they will affix the mezuzah on their doorposts. You know, it's so important to try and get people close. Zukiruv. There's an amazing language in the Zoya. In Simpasha Stuma and I'm going to say it in English. The language of the Zohar is, if people knew how much benefits and merit they would acquire when they merit others with repentance, with tshuva, they would go after them and pursue them as one who pursues life itself. Another question about tshuva. The Baron Leib Shteyman Zechir Tzadik Livracha was asked by an individual who was becoming a Baal Shuba. He said to him, listen, I'm not there yet, 100%. I'm on my way. So I'm willing to do one of two. You tell me what, which one to choose. Rebbe, what should I do? Should I accept on myself Shabbos or Tara Samishpacha? Family purity or Shabbos? Don't tell me to combine because it's not happening. I'm not there yet, Rebbe. I'm willing to do one. Maybe with time we'll accept the other as well, but... For now, only one. So, Rebbe, what do you suggest that I take upon myself first? Shabbos or family purity? What do you say, my friends? Shabbos. Why? Shabbos, because it's, it's such a basic part of being UD. Uh -huh. And family purity is not? Yes, yes, it is too. But that, but Shabbos comes whether you want it to or not. It's it, The seventh day comes, yeah, but... You, a man and, and a woman don't have to be together. together. They don't have to be taken. But they will be together. If they're not going to be together, they're going to get divorced. But but to start off, it, the right place to start would be to start with Shabbat. Remember, this is the husband asking, and his wife is, um, maybe she is together with him, maybe she's not, but he wants to know what's better. I hear what you're saying. Shabbos, in fact, is great. Shabbos is one violate Shabbos, Chazal say, it's tantamount to uh, serving a boy dasala. Big stuff. But I can hear an argument for the other side as well. Anyone thinks that we should go with family purity before Shabbos? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, because it affects also the children. Children definitely that aren't born yet. And um, I think the whole spiritual part of the, of the family, of course, you'll say, and what about Shabbos? Right. So, um, well, certainly it's for children who aren't born. They should be born with child rough. Uh, that affects their whole, their whole spiritual being. This child went to Rav Shteyman Zetzal. And know what the Chiddush is here? The Chiddush is that Rav Shteyman sent this Shaila to Rebbe Yoshif Zatzal. That in itself is a Chiddush. And Rebbe Yoshif said an amazing thing. Family purity. Why? Because nobody really has a major desire. I want to break Shabbos! Nobody has a Yetzer to violate Shabbos. People do violate Shabbos, but not because you have a great lust, a great desire to break the laws of Shabbos, because you want to go to the beach, you want to do other things. But family purity, people do have the great lust, the great yetzer to violate. And in, in Bab Metziah, Daf Lamed Beis, Amud Beis, we learn that Kviyasa Yetzer, succumbing, 
challenging your yetzer and beating it is a tremendous, tremendous thing. It's so great that Chazal explained if one has a friend who has a donkey and you have to help him unload the donkey, a mitzvah di oraisa, but right over there on the other side of the street is your enemy, a guy you can't stand. And he has a donkey and you have to help him load the donkey. We would say, of course, you should run and help your friend's donkey and unload the burden. And Chazal say, no, in that case, you should go to the guy you don't like and help him load the animal. Because we're not interested in you having any bad feelings towards anybody in Klai Yisrael. But wait a second, it's the Oraisa. And yet, you see the Kfiyas Yetzer. Challenging your Yetzer is a great thing, but more than that, Rabbi Yoshi explained, Shabbos is you. You're going to accept Shabbos in yourself, that's great, but it's one person. Family purity, it's two people sinning. And for those two reasons, Rabbi Yoshi said, family purity. And hopefully soon you'll, you'll do Shabbos as well, but until they'll start with family purity. But then there was a girl who came, a young girl who came to the Bishtamin and asked a similar question. She said, you know, I'm getting stronger, becoming a Babas Tshuva, and I have 250 shekels available to do one of two. Rabbi, what do you suggest? Should I kasher my wardrobe and switch my clothing to sneistic ones or kasher my kitchen? What should I do? And don't tell me to combine because it's not happening. I'm not there yet. I only have 250 shekels. Either or, you choose and tell me. Kasher my clothing or kasher my kitchen. What do you say, my friends? The clothing, the clothing, Why? definitely. Why Modesty, it? because for a woman, the youth is like a man learning Torah. It's so, it's so important. Like it's the most important for a woman. It's definitely extremely important. Extremely important. Because she also causes other. She causes also men to sin uh -huh. at the same time. There you go. Just like we said before, it's not just about you. Every time this lady goes out, she stumbles, makes others stumble. It's a mitzvah diorisa to walk sneezingly. But it's not just her mitzvah. She causes others to sin. But more than that, sneez is a mitzvah diorisa. All the questions, all the problems she may have in the kitchen are only going to be the rabbanon. Nothing was cooked here in the last 24 hours. It's not ben yoimo. So everything is reduced to a derabonon. When you have a deraisa and you have a derabonon, you should go with a deraisa. And you know what? Just live on fruits and vegetables. There's no problem in the kitchen. So for those two reasons, sneeze. And in Pasha's kid says that this, Pasha, this Shabbos, we're going to lay, we're going to read that if there's lack of sneeze, the Kodesh Baruch Hu says, Veshav me'acharecha. Kodesh Baruch Hu removes his holy shina when there's lack of sneeze. Who would want that? And therefore, the Shaman said, if sneeze over Kashrus of the kitchen at this point, at this point, and hopefully soon you'll do both, you get two points. But you see from here how makpid we have to be on matters that also have to do with others, not just about ourselves. You see that when we get stronger, we have to give prioritization to something that will affect not only us, they will affect others. They have a great suggestion. One of them is start smiling. When you smile to others, it makes them feel great. It doesn't cost you anything. It's a great little Kabbalah to smile to people. A voice I have a riddle. It sounds very provocative. Maybe chutzpah. There's 150 chapters in Tehillim. 150 chapters. Which one is the most honorable? Chashuv. Chapter from all the chapters of Tehillim, if we can even ask such a question. 150 chapters, what do you say? Which one is the most hush the most honorable chapter in Tehillim? Kuf Yutes is the longest one. Kuf Yutes is the longest one. Does that make it the most honorable one? Why not the shortest one? Kuf Yudzain, Tup Supi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe the first one. The first one. Maybe the last one. 
No, the first thing, because it's Ashrei Ha'isha Sha'alo Lach, they're telling man exactly what to do. Ashrei Ha'isha Lo Lach, the, if we got all the words and the True. bad way. True. But the last one is all about the praise of the Kulish Bogu. Hallelujah. Well, 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 What's that? Kol Hanashama Talel Yah Yah. Kol Hanashama. Great. Who says it's the most honorable? You have any uh, documentation to show us? Any proof to that? I think Kuf Gimel. Kuf Gimel. What? Kaf Gimel or Kuf Gimel? Kaf Gimel. Kaf Gimel. Why is that? Because it says Hashem Roi. Hashem. Hashem Roi lo yachsah, but this Baruch is my shepherd. Even if I walk in the shadow of death, I'm always protected by Kodesh Baruch Hu. And there aren't any comparable psukim throughout the 150 chapters that you can find? I think they're all equal. But I'm asking which one is most honorable, and it's not a trick question. No, it's honorable. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, if one of them is Ashrei. Ready, which one? I'm sorry, Ashrei? Ashrei, that's Kosech Yisadecha. You... you... No, no. First of all, Ashrei is not a name of a chapter because the Pasuk Ashrei doesn't go there. Yeah. It starts yeah. with yeah. Tehillah le David. That chapter is called Tehillah le David, Kuf Mem 145. But that's yeah. a great, yeah. great chapter. But who says it's the most honorable one? Yeah, yeah. You know who asks this question? None other than the Ibn Ezra, one of the Rishonim. In the Hakdama to chapter 139. Kuf Lamentes, the Ibn Ezra writes an amazing thing. Listen to a language of Ibn Ezra, I'll say it in Hebrew. I'll quote him and then I'll translate to English. This chapter is very honorable in the ways of Hashem. Yes. And there is no other chapter in these five books that comprise the Tehillim, any other chapter like it. And if a person really observes, looks into this, he will understand according to his level. What in the world did the Ibn Ezra find in Tehillim Kufla Metes? What is this? I have a title for this chapter, Kufla Mentes. I call it, You Can Run, But You Can't Hide. Listen to a language of David Amelech. Ana mi panecha evrach. Where shall I go from your spirit? And where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, there you are. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take up the wings of dawn, if I dwell at the end of the west, here too your hand will lead me, and your right hand will grasp me. Even darkness will not obscure anything from you, and the light and the night will light up the, like the day, as darkness so is the light. You can run, but you can't hide. I think what the Ibn Ezra is saying, that if one thinks about this chapter, if one has this in mind, at all times, he will never sin because he realizes that Kodesh Baruch is always right there with me. He's standing right here. Let's make a difference where I go, how far I go. Kodesh Baruch is right there. This chapter is the greatest tool to always do everything wrong. Everything right because the Kodesh Baruch is with you. You can't go wrong. Look at that chapter. Kuf Lamentes. Say it over and over again. It can change your life. Right. You know, in the last Mishnah in Masech Yuma, famous Mishnah, Perek Ches, Mishnah Tes, the language of Chazal is, Ha'oymer, echta ve'ashuv, echta ve'ashuv, ein maspikin be'yado la'asos tshuva. A person says, I will sin, and then I'll do tshuva. I will sin, and then I'll do tshuva. Ein maspikin be'yado la'asos tshuva. He's not going to have a chance to do tshuva. One who says, echta, I will sin, but then Yom Kippur comes around. It will atone for me. The Mishnah continues and says, 
אשריכם ישראל, praise worthy היו כלל ישראל, לפני מי אתם מתארים? before whom do you purify yourselves? ומי מתאר אסכם? who purifies you? אביכם שבשמיים, your father in heaven. הנביא עקיבא says, מקווה ישראל השם, הקודש ברוך הוא like a מקווה. מה מקווה מתאר אס הטמאים? אף הקודש ברוך הוא מתאר אס ישראל. just like the מקווה purifies those who are impure. So too HaKadosh Baruch Hu purifies Kalal Yisrael. I have a question about this Mishnah. If a person says, Ech tave ashuv, ech tave ashuv, en mastikim biyad ola azos tshuva, I will sin and I will repent, I will sin and I will repent, he's not going to have a chance to do tshuva. Why not? Why not? He wants to do tshuva. What do you want from the guy? Says the Torah Tmimah. What's the sin? Says the Torah Tmimah. Tosef es Bracha, the author of the Torah Tmimah. He brings the Minchas Chinuch in Mitzvah Tet, who has an interesting Chakira. The Minchas Chinuch wants to know. A person who doesn't have Chametz before Pesach, does he have to buy Chametz in order to fulfill the Mitzvah from the Torah called Tashbitu? You have to destroy, eradicate all Chametz before Pesach, but I don't have any Chametz. So do I have to buy some Chametz in order to fulfill the Mitzvah? According to this, the Ramban says the mitzvah of tshuva is a positive mitzvah from the Torah. As the Pasuk says, the shavta ad Hashem lokecha, you should repent, you should come close to Kodesh Baruch So maybe a person who knows about himself that he never sinned, maybe he needs to sin in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tshuva. So what do you want from this guy? Because if this is so, and he's such a tzaddik, and he wants to sin in order to fulfill this mitzvah, he wants to do all the mitzvahs, it would be sufficient to say, echta, I will sin and I will repent. Why does this guy repeating himself and saying it twice? What did he say? I will sin and I repent. I will sin and repent. Why do you say it twice? Just sin once. A small little sin and do tshuva. You don't want to sin. You don't want to do tshuva. You are interested in sinning. And because of that, and must pick in the yadoy, lazos tshuva. But the Kreuzenberger Rebbe, he looked at this Mishnah and he said something totally different. The Kreuzenberg Rebbe said in this Mishnah, we read it as if a person who says, I'm going to sin and then repent, and must pick in the Adulasus Chuba. And then we read the beautiful words of Rabbi Akiva, Ay, Akonish Bochu is like a mikveh, he purifies Klal Yisrael. Says the Kreuzenberg Rebbe, you're reading it wrong. There's a machloikis in this Mishnah. Tanakama, the first opinion, the first Tana quoted in the Mishnah, says, if you say, I will sin and repent, it doesn't work. But Rabbi Akiva comes to argue. And Rabbi Akiva says, no! HaKadosh Baruch Hu is like a mikveh. You know what that means? A person jumps into the mikveh. He comes out, and then he becomes impure again. So what? Jump right back! But what if it happened again? He touched a sheretz. Oy vey! He became impure. So jump into the mikveh again. But what if it happened 452 times? So what? Doesn't make a difference. A thousand times. Every time you jump into the mikveh, if you do it right, you come out. You're pure. Rabbi Akiva says, wrong. Don't tell me if you sin and say, I will repent. Sin and say, and say I will repent. It doesn't work. No, HaKadosh Baruch was like a mikveh. Just like in the mikveh. You go a thousand times. Every time you come out, you are pure. So too, person who wants to do true, HaKadosh Baruch will accept him. HaKadosh Baruch is like a mikveh. And that, I think, is just a, such a beautiful interpretation. But there is another interpretation, and that is for sure correct. What does one do before he goes into the mikveh in order to ensure that it worked, that he became pure? Before one goes down into the water, he has to close his eyes, close his mouth, and then he goes down, he dips, he comes out, and he is pure. Says Rabbi Akiva, HaKadosh Baruch is like a mikveh. If you want it to work, you want the process of purity to work, close your eyes. Don't look at what you're not allowed to look. Close your mouth. Don't say what you're not allowed to say. If you're willing to do that, says the Kodesh Bochu, I'm willing to be your mikveh. And I will purify you just like the mikveh purifies those who are impure. That is for sure a correct interpretation in the mitzvah. You know, there is a statement that the Zoya HaKodesh says, that I think we should carve in our hearts. Zoya HaKodesh in Shemois 
Daf Hey Amud Beis. Listen to a language on the Zoya. Ilu Hayu Yodin Bnei Adam. Es Ahava. She Oev Hashem Es Bnei Adam. Hayu Shoyagim Kekfir Lirdoif Achara. If people would only know the love that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for them, they would roar like lion cubs to pursue HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let's say it again. If people would only know the great love HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for us, they would roar like lions to pursue HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We should be joyful to know there's a father in Shemaim. He loves us. And he wants us to get close. Just like any father. So any same father who will say to his son who comes and says, Daddy, I'm sorry. I did wrong. Please forgive me. No! You're out! No such thing. There's no such thing. A father will always accept a sincere apology open arms, embrace, and a kiss. And that's what tshuva is all about. We should be zoyche to do tshuva me'ahava. And then not only do our sins erase, they are transformed into schusim, into mitzvahs, into diamonds. Mitzvah Hashem. We should all be zoyche to do tshuva me'ahava. Thank you, my friends. Amen.